Okay, well, let's go ahead and take our Bibles tonight. We're going to turn to the book of uh, 2 Thessalonians, the book of 2 Thessalonians, as we continue our series in 2 Thessalonians. We're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 tonight, the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 3. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 3, hate to ask you to do this, uh, you just sat down, but we are going to stand in reverence to God's Word, if you are able to, and if not, just go ahead and follow along with us. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and beginning in verse number 3, where Paul writes the encouraging words, but the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we command. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do ask now that you would uh, be with, uh, again, Lord, just the preaching of your word, and we thank you for it. We thank you for all the classes also that are going on right now, and Father, we want to bring you glory and honor. May you be lifted up, and may your church be edified tonight. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. The Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. As I said last week, the last chapter of this letter written by Paul to the church in Thessalonica, it can be outlined in the following way. First, in verses 1 through 2, we looked last week at Paul's concern. And then, of course, uh, verses 3 and 4, which we're on tonight, Paul's confidence. And then verse uh, verse number 5 is Paul's counsel Verses 6 through 15, Paul's commands, and then verses 16 through 18 is Paul's conclusion. So last week we looked at Paul's concern and determined that Paul was really trying in this section to get the congregation in the church to have a heart for him as their church planter and also for those who worked with them and served with them in the church, those pastors and those teachers in verses 1 and 2. And, and this would be an expansion of what he said in his first letter when he wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be, peace, uh, and be at peace among yourselves. So in verses 1 and 2 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he starts it by saying, Finally, brethren, pray for us. And of course, we broke up these two verses last week by explaining the necessitation of a preacher. He needs your consideration. He needs your care. He needs you to pray for him. He needs you to uh, care for him. The aspiration of a preacher. He went on to say that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. And, of course, that was his aspiration, the distribution of God's Word and the reception of God's Word, that the Word would have free course and people would have the ability to receive the Word as it was preached. And then, of course, we looked at the anticipation of the preacher. Also, in verse number 2, he said, "...and that we may be delivered..." from unreasonable and wicked men. So we saw that the preacher, or that Paul, anticipated uh, coming up against unreasonable and wicked men. And of course, uh, Paul certainly did have those times where he would come up against men that were unreasonable and men that were, uh, that were just uh, flat out wicked. Well, tonight we are moving on down to verses 3 through 5. And, of course, uh, uh, this is the closing chapter of this letter. We're going to deal with Paul's confidence, understanding again that though written directly to the church in Thessalonica, the Holy Spirit preserved these things for our learning and for our admonition. So all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So these things certainly are applicable to us as a church here in Hillsboro. So as we consider Paul's confidence from his own statements, we can ascertain that Paul's confidence was in the Lord. Verse number 3, he says, But the Lord is faithful. 
And really, you could really you could pretty much end it right there. The Lord is faithful. And thus we can trust in Him, and, and thus we can live for Him. Thus we can find our strength in Him. The Lord is faithful. And so Paul's confidence was not in Paul, and, and it wasn't in the people in the church there in Thessalonica. I, if your confidence is in the flesh, you're going to be gravely disappointed. He said, the Lord is faithful. People would fail Paul. We know one of those verses in which Paul wrote there in 2 Timothy the end of that chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he reveals one of those men that had failed him when he says, Demas hath forsaken me. And of course, I'm sure Demas was not the only one that failed Paul throughout his ministry and, and throughout his life. As a matter of fact, just about everyone we know is going to fail us at one time or another. As a matter of fact, we're even going to fail ourselves. And so we ought not have any confidence in the flesh. But Paul says that the Lord is faithful. The challenge is that we all would have confidence in God and in his word. And so Paul gives us four reasons that we can be confident in the Lord. Just in these two verses here, four reasons that we can be confident in the Lord. Reason number one, the Lord is the source of reliability. The Lord is the source of reliability. Verse number three, the Lord is faithful. Our God, number one, never fails. He never fails. And thankfully, our Lord never has extenuating circumstances that keep him from fulfilling his promises. Every single one of us have made a promise but due to some kind of extenuating circumstance, maybe it was an illness, or maybe it was something else that we couldn't help. I know that uh, there's been a time or two when I promised to pick someone up, but then the car broke down, or something like that. Extenuating circumstances that we just can't help. But you know what? God never has those circumstances. God always comes through. He is the source of reliability. You talk about someone who's reliable, God is reliable 100% of the time. And so the Lord is faithful. Now we can say that about people. We know people who are faithful, but even the most faithful person is not faithful 100% of the time. Because things do come up. People do get ill. People get sick. Um, I can remember going rummaging when I was a kid through some of my dad's stuff in this trunk that he had, and I came across this uh, award that he had gotten for perfect attendance uh, in school. My dad had perfect attendance from kindergarten all the way through sixth grade. And I thought, man, that is remarkable, uh, perfect attendance. I said, Dad, what happened in seventh grade? He said, I got the mumps, extenuating circumstances, things that we cannot help. Now, you would say about my dad for that time, man, he was faithful. Even after getting the mumps, you would have to say, man, he was faithful to school. He was faithful in his attendance. But no man is 100%. But our God is 100%. Because he's not only reliable, our God is the source of reliability. And thankfully, those extenuating circumstances never come up. Can you imagine living all your life thinking that you're saved and then you come to the pearly gates and, and the Lord says, well, you know what? Uh, I don't have you on the list here. You're not in the Lamb's book of life. And you say, well, I know I, I know I called upon you to be my Savior. It was on this certain day in, in, in 1983. And the Lord looks and says, what date, what, what date was that? Oh, man, I must have missed it because I was sick that day. And so I totally missed out. Now, we need the Lord to be 100% faithful, not just 99% faithful. That's not good enough. Our God is the source of of reliability. As many of you know, for many years, Quarter Baptist Church was in charge of our youth camps. 
When in charge of things like that, I've always tried to have my speakers set up several years in advance. I, I, I just, uh, I don't want to have to be worrying about, man, who's my speaker tomorrow? Or who's my speaker next week? And so I would, I would line them up uh, years in advance. Usually I'd be two or three years uh, down the road where he had speakers that uh, were lined up. One thing I learned, however, is no matter how reliable certain individuals may be, extenuating circumstances do come up. I remember one year I was on vacation, and it was one of those years that I decided to take a vacation just before camp, which uh, was not very wise of me. But I can remember um, uh, getting a, a voicemail from our camp speaker, which was in about two weeks, to find out he wasn't going to be able to go. And that was the one and only time that that happened. But uh, when you rely on something like that, man, it, it's tough. It's too late to get another speaker. And he was, he had a good excuse. He had an illness in the family. And he just wasn't going to be able to make it. But thank the Lord, he never has those circumstances. He is 100% reliable. Our God's commitments are ironclad. What used to really drive me crazy about camp was when I would ask the preachers at the end of every camp, can we count on you for next year's camp? Can we count on you to go next year? Can we count on you to bring kids? Can we count on you to send kids? To which they would say, yes, we are in. That was always the determining factor for me. Am I going to take camp next week, uh, next year? I'll take camp next year if you all are going to come. I'll take camp next year if you all are going to be involved. Yes, we are going to be there. Yes, we're going to be involved. Yes, we are going to send kids. Several years, however, after not hearing from certain churches, I would, I would call them up a week before camp and say, you still haven't gotten your numbers in. To have the pastor say, oh, didn't we tell you we decided we're not going to camp this year? Which would always put us in the bind because we were counting on the numbers because the, uh, the numbers is what... Uh, uh, well, brought in the finances so that we could pay the camp. Our church would write the check every year for camp, and, and we're talking a, a check that was nearly $20,000, so not necessarily a check that we could just absorb as a church on our own. And I can remember that would just drive me nuts to hear, oh, we decided we're not going to camp this year. Oh, we decided that we're going to go on a missions trip this year. Probably one of the reasons that for many years I hated missions trips was because of that very thing. I would have churches say, uh, after committing the year before, well, we're not going because we decided it would be beneficial to go on a missions trip. Praise the Lord, God never calls us up and says, oh, you know what? I've changed my mind. I'm not going to save you after all. Oh, I've changed my mind. You know that Messiah that I promised back in the book of Genesis? We're going to call that off. We're going to change things up just a little bit because we decided we didn't really want to go through with that. To a smaller scale, this happens uh, at church, whether it be the nursery workers who decide to attend another church service that week or uh, or, or a, a Sunday school teacher who decides Saturday night oh, we're, or Friday night we're going to go on a, on, a, on a weekend getaway. We just need a weekend getaway. Not realizing what kind of a lurch that puts the church in for that class or for the nursery or whatever it may be. Being Christ-like means your commitments, large or small, are ironclad. Because the Lord is faithful. And if the Lord is faithful and the Lord lives in his people, then God's people also ought to be faithful. And they ought to keep their commitments. But as a pastor, I can testify to you that well, it's getting harder and harder to find people you can rely on just to be in the church services, let alone take a class or, or work a ministry. But the Lord is faithful. Thank the Lord 
that he is faithful. He is the source of reliability. And if we're not reliable, it's because we're not tapping into that source, nor are we following our God's example. Because our God never fails. But our God also never fibs. Our God never fibs. Sadly, some people make commitments without ever intending to hold to those com commitments, or they make a commitment to, until that commitment becomes too difficult to keep, or they'll make a commitment unless something better comes along. But our God never fibs. He is faithful to the end. He is faithful no matter what. No matter how hard it gets, He's still faithful. Our Lord still went to the cross, even though the Bible says that uh, uh, it, it, it caused uh, Jesus in the flesh all kinds of anxiety. This is why God does not change his mind or his policies, because he doesn't fib. As old-fashioned as some believe that his policies may be, Jesus is not running for office, nor is he interested in popularity polls. The truth is the truth, whether we like it or not. By the way, God made them. He created them male and female, and he didn't change his mind just because culture has changed and given us 30 or 50 or 70 different genders. Male and female created he them, and he's not changed because our God never fibs. Our God never fails, and our God never forgets because he is the source of reliability. Have you ever forgotten? <laughs> Have you ever made a commitment and just genuinely forgot about it? I mean, just genuinely forgot. And when you realize it, oh man, I was going to be here. Or, oh man, I was going to do this. Or I made a promise, and I just totally spaced it. I totally forgot about it. There's not too many feelings in the world that are worse than that. When you just totally forgot, and you, uh, you promised you'd be somewhere, you'd promised you'd do something, or you promised uh, you made some kind of a commitment, and it just slipped your mind. You might have even put it on your calendar or put it in your phone, but it just slipped your mind. You totally forgot all about it. Well, thankfully, our God never forgets. Even when it seems as if he has, God never forgets. Remember Mordecai? It took time before God finally blessed him for his integrity, but bless him, God did. Remember in that situation where two of the king's chamberlains, they had conspired against the king, and Mordecai, the Bible says, reported it to the queen, and the queen brought it to the king in Mordecai's name, save the king's life. And then the Bible tells us that the very next chapter, the king elevated or, or, or gave, a, gave a position that really should have been Mordecai's, gave it to one of Mordecai's mortal enemies. But God didn't forget. God was just setting it up so that Mordecai's enemy would have to honor Mordecai. It was just, it was, if you've never read the book of Esther, you need to read it. One of the greatest stories, and we know it's more than a story, it's a narrative. It actually happened. But it's one of the greatest stories that, that, that uh, has ever been told. And it's true. It's, it's so good. It seems like a fairy tale. But it's a wonderful story. But we learn God doesn't forget. You wonder if maybe Mordecai wasn't like us a little bit and thought that maybe God had forgotten about him. But God hadn't forgotten it had been written down, it had been marked down, and, and in the nick of time, God caused the king to have a sleepless night, and the king went and read the books of the Chronicles, or the book of happenings, and as he did, he was reminded, man, Mordecai saved my life, and I never did anything for him, and 
God rewarded him greatly. James reminds us that often our faith is tried by patience. In other words, it's going to seem as though God has forgotten, but God doesn't forget. James chapter 1, James chapter 1, and James deals a lot with this. He deals a lot with faith and patience. By the way, if it happened, if it happened immediately, we wouldn't need faith, would we? But faith is required because God wants us to be patient. And in James chapter 1, verse number 3, James writes this, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. In other words, if you are patient, you will realize that even when it seems like God's forgotten, he hasn't forgotten. And so the man of God can be perfect and entire, wanting nothing because he realizes God hasn't forgotten. It's just not his time yet. He hasn't forgotten about us. It's just not his time. Notice the list Peter says we are to add to our faith in 2 Peter chapter 1 and in verse number 5. He says there's some things we are to add to our faith and that these things need to be added diligently to our faith. 2 Peter 1, verse number 5, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to, uh, and to knowledge, he says, temperance, and to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. But add to, add to your, your faith, he says, patience is one of those things. The fruit of the Spirit, which we receive upon salvation, according to Galatians chapter 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, long-suffering, Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such, there is no law. God does not forget. God does not fib. And God never fails. He is the source of reliability. But the second thing, or the second reason that we ought to have faith in the Lord, or the second reason we ought to be encouraged in Him is also found in verse number 3, 2 Thessalonians. Let's get back to our main text, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 3. The Lord is the source of reliability, but, but secondly, the Bible tells us in verse number 3, the Lord is faithful who shall establish you. The Lord is the source of stability. He's not only the source of reliability, he is the source of of stability. And this is in your personal life and in your spiritual life. See, we live in a world where even those things that ought to be considered stable are no longer stable. One thing children ought to be able to count on is their parents and their parents' marriage. Kids should not have to come home to find that dad has moved out or that mom has run away with the neighbor. It's natural for kids to feel that with the exception of death, their parents will always be there. Not the case in our society today. As a matter of fact, the other day, uh, Dana and I were watching the original Parent Trap, which was back in 1961. And you know, that, that show was actually very prophetic. Um, we were watching when the two girls, if you don't know anything about, you didn't watch that Disney movie, uh, The Parent Trap, it started Haley Mills, and started Haley Mills, and she played twins. And uh, the, the twins had been separated when they were babies because mom and dad had, had divorced, and, and one lived in California, and one lived in Massachusetts, and one kept one twin, one kept the other twin, well, it just so happens, by coincidence, they sent their twins to the same camp in, in the United States there. 
and there they met. They looked exactly alike, and they didn't get along, and they ended up being isolated in a cabin where they got to talk and found out they were actually sisters. They were twin sisters. And one of the statements that, that they made was how unfair it was that their parents had separated them, and that uh, if, if, if we're not careful, we're going to live in a society where there's more divorced people than there are married people. And you think about the prophecy of that statement right there. Uh, divo the divorce rate now is, is over 50%. And uh, for kids to have the same parents from the time that they were bo they're born in the family to the time that they graduate... Uh, it is rare today because chances are that source of stability that, that's embedded in them is, is ripped apart in their childhood. Sometimes the parents actually wait till their children are adults, but nonetheless, it still affects them. Uh, here's the thing. We live in a society where... Nothing is stable, but our God is still faithful. He's the source of stability. The Bible says don't be established by the, the wiles of the devil and don't be established by the philosophies of the world. The philosophies of the world change. My generation, when we were kids, we were told to prepare for an ice age. Now this generation is told to prepare for global warming because everything is going to fry. Matter of fact, one politician recently even said that we'd be dead in, in 12 years, that the world's going to end. And of course, uh, who could remember? Our vice president under Clinton, Mr. Gore, told us that, uh, I think it was by what, to 2016, that New York was going to be completely underwater. And so... Uh, even the philosophies of the world, they change. But God never changes. Let Him establish you. Be established in Him and Him alone. Listen, even though uh, divorce and polygamy were rampant in the Old Testament, it was never meant to be that way. In Matthew chapter 19, verse number 4, Jesus says, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they twain shall be one flesh, wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. And that portion of scripture addresses a whole lot of things. It addresses the transgender movement. The Bible says that God made them male and female. Male and female created he them. It, uh, uh, it, it, it also talks about uh, uh, divorce, what, what God has joined together. Let not man put asunder. It also addresses polygamy. They twain, by the way, twain means two. They twain shall be one flesh. And so it addresses a whole lot of things. And let God establish you, not the philosophies of the world that are ever-changing. No wonder we lived in such a confused society, because what's good today will be bad tomorrow, and what's right today will be wrong tomorrow. But with God, what was wrong today is still wrong tomorrow and was wrong yesterday, and what was right yesterday is right today and will be right tomorrow. It'll always be the same. So let the Lord establish you. If marriage is of God, it can be stabilized by God. Married couples need to be committed to God's work. Proverbs 16.3 says, commit thy work unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. You realize that if your thoughts are established, that everything else in your life is established? Because it's our thoughts that take us away from where we ought to be. But if you commit your work unto the Lord, your thoughts are established, and then everything else will be established. And so not only is he the source of stability in your 
personal life. Obviously, he's the source of stability in your spiritual life, in your spiritual life. When Paul wrote to the church uh, in Ephesus, he said that God gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith. That means we ought to be unified in faith. In other words, there's only one faith. That's how you become unified in faith. There's one faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and the cunning of craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Proverbs 24, 21 says, My son, fear thou the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change. The Lord establish you. The Lord is faithful. He is the source of reliability. He is the source of stability. And number three, the Lord is the source of nobility. He's the source of nobility. Once again, verse number three, the Lord is faithful. That's his reliability. Who shall establish you? That is his stability. And keep you from evil. That's his nobility. This, of course, does not mean you are exempt from evil things happening or evil people being evil to you. It does, however, mean that God can keep you from being and committing evil. The Lord keep you from evil. Listen, you want to be a noble individual? You want to be an individual of, uh, of virtue? You want to be someone who's moral? The Lord keep you from evil. In other words, trust in his word. Know his word. Believe his word. Know what it says and obey it. The Lord is the source of reliability. He is the source of stability. He's the source of nobility. And last of all, the Lord is the source of dependability. Look at verse number four. We have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we command. If we hope to have the wherewithal to perform and to do the Lord's will, we need to put our faith and trust in him to do so. We can't do this on our own. We can't live for the Lord by sheer willpower. People who try to do it in the flesh fail miserably, and they get nothing but discouraged. In Galatians 2, verse number 20, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Crucify the flesh. Don't try to live for the Lord in the flesh. Don't try to have the willpower to live for the Lord. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, and gave himself for me. The Lord is the source of dependability. Philippians 4.13, Paul writes, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. He is the source of reliability. He is the source of stability. He is the source of nobility to keep you from being evil. He's also the source of dependability. You know, the key, the secret to living for the Lord is letting the Lord live in and through you. We can't do it in the flesh. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. The Lord is faithful, his reliability. Who shall establish you? His stability. He keeps you from evil, his nobility. 
And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the things which we command. You notice Paul doesn't say, I have confidence in you. I, I, uh, I'm relying upon you. I'm counting on you. No, Paul says, I'm counting on the Lord to keep you. In other words, as long as you stay close to the Lord, you will do what we've commanded you. You will come through and you'll follow through and you will, uh, you'll be successful in everything that you try to do as long as you rely on the Lord to do it in and through you. The Lord is the source of dependability. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed with every head bowed.